Hello, Insatiable listeners. Season six is now complete. We are on a break in between seasons. I'll return on Wednesday, February 13th with a new theme and a big surprise. I can't wait to share it with you. I am so bad at surprises. So let's just say that if you love the type of conversations we have here, rabbit holes and experimenting, you're going to love it. In the meantime, enjoy these podcast interviews I've done recently. There are quite a range of topics, but hey, you know that's how we roll here. And there will be a few classic episodes leading up to season seven that will help you get the most out of the season and a clue about the theme. Also, if you enjoy the show or have benefited from it, I'd so appreciate a review. You guys totally rallied this summer to get us to over 100. We're currently at 105, and I would love for us to get to 150 by spring. It really helps the show as it makes it easier for others to find it. And I'd like to read two recent reviews. This one from Insatiable Listener, and her review, or his, was more smash the part patriarchy than light and love. If you want trite, simplistic solutions to health and wellness, this is not the podcast for you. You won't find bad diets or tidy Instagrammable quotes, but that's why it's amazing. Allie has a gift for interviewing that brings out her subject's authentic wisdom. It's perfect if you're curious about how to be healthier in all senses of the word, appreciate the nuance and complexity of our unique bodies, or if you just want to hear smart people talking to each other about how to navigate and destroy cultural systems and reassess our, cult- our collective values. Thank you so much for that uh, five-star review, insatiable listener. <laughs> Love that you're into uh, reassessing our collective values. And another one that I'll share from Design Lover 757997. Nuance, smart, and sassy too is the title of her five-star review. She says, I'm exhausted of the constant unhealthy messages that barrage us everywhere from Instagram feeds. Seriously, those people with the super round butts, they don't tell you it's implants. To our diet culture in general, insatiable is my personal weapon of resistance against those messages. It's balanced, intelligent, and Allie, the host of the podcast, brings in some of the most interesting people I've heard in podcast interviews. Look, if you want to break free from rigid rules, but still live a healthy and balanced life, Insatiable can help you carve out your own path. No rules, no dogma, just thoughtful new ways of seeing and being in the world. Thank you so much, Design Lover 757997. And I'll be reading some more (laughs) uh, in in some upcoming episodes. If you have time or, again, have benefited from the podcast, here's how you can leave a review. You launch Apple's podcast app. You tap the search tab and you enter the name of the podcast you want to rate or review, in this case, Insatiable. Tap the blue search key at the bottom right. Tap the album art for the podcast. Tap the reviews tab and then tap write a review at the bottom. And if you don't have time for that, if you could just rate it, how many stars you would rate it. That is also super helpful as well. And thank you for being a listener. Having stimulating conversations is what I most treasure in my life. And I get to have them here. And then with you on Instagram, where I connect with so many of you through your emails and, and also with our guests. It's a joy I cherish deeply. Look forward to seeing you back here in a couple of weeks for new episodes on Wednesday, February 13th. And in the meantime, enjoy these recent interviews and classic episodes. And I think initially what is helpful is just to kind of start to notice. Are you somebody who often has a runny nose? Are you somebody who often, like, it has a hard time sweating when you exercise? You know, just starting to notice, like, hot and cold and moisture and dryness, like how your body operates can just be an initial swipe at it. Are you somebody who is thirsty a lot, you know, or do you just, are you thirsty even though you're drinking a lot of water? You know, just starting to notice your body's patterns can be the first step. So yeah, people from Plato and Aristotle up through Galileo and Copernicus and all these great thinkers that that we, you know, maybe we remember hearing their names in history class. 
they all use this holistic Western system of understanding these four different ways of being in the world. And they did have this idea that everything in the world was made up of either water, fire, air, or water. And of course, once we moved into modern science, we went, oh God, that's preposterous. I mean, you know, we have atoms and we have protons and we've got this, that, and the other. And so they threw that completely out. And part of part of what was in that system, that four element system, was this idea that it's that that at the very core we're made of essence, which is this kind of um, non-physical stuff that is that's our soul and our spirit, and that comes first, and then our physical body comes. food and your body doesn't work. You want to love and accept yourself. And because you're insatiable, you want results too. You bring the same intensity to your life, wanting to maximize your time, potential, and experiences you have here on our beautiful and wondrous planet Earth. Fair warning, it will be a roller coaster. But for those insatiable, this is your prime time to thrive. Here's to saying yes to the hunger of wanting it all. I'm your host, Ali Shapiro, who is dedicated to pioneering a saner and more empowering approach to health and weight loss. Welcome to episode 86 of the Insatiable Podcast, how to use astrology to achieve your health goals with Molly Morrissey. Most of us know if we're a Libra or a Capricorn, but did you know that that is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to classical astrology? It turns out, much like today's nutrition information, mainstream astrology is reduced to a one-size-fits-all assumption based on one planet in your chart. The reality is, when you understand the uniqueness of your entire astrological chart, you can understand more about yourself and how to use your essence to support your health goals. What I love about Molly, and the reason I wanted to have her on the show, is she studied astrology and human behavior deeply. In this fascinating interview, you will get a perspective on astrology that's totally different than what you're expecting. And even though I've worked with Molly and prepped for our interview, I found myself having some great aha moments. I can't wait for you to hear Molly's perspective. In this episode, you're going to learn how traditional astrology, which assumed each of our physical bodies had a spiritual essence, was historically the primary basis of health and medicine. Second, the four traditional astrological elements and how identifying your elemental makeup empowers you to know what foods and emotional patterns support your nature so you can work with yourself instead of fighting yourself. And lastly, how traditional astrology's healing elements were stripped away because they worked and the powers that be at the time wanted to keep the knowledge for themselves. And we get into a, an interesting side conversation, how many royal families still use astrology today. We also discuss how to get your own free chart on astro.com and what planets and houses to look for in your chart that rule your health. For my wise rebels who love truth and freedom, you're going to love this episode. Here's a little bit more about Molly. Molly Morrissey works with creatives, entrepreneurs, and professionals who are looking for a deeper sense of understanding about themselves and their life patterns. By unearthing and connecting internal and external clues and timing cycles, we are able to build a more resilient and pragmatic strategy for moving forward. With a master's degree in applied behavioral science and systems counseling from Bastyr University and astrological training with master astrologer John Frowley, she also incorporates backgrounds in architecture and the marine industry into her unique offerings. After having spent the large majority of her life in Seattle, she now lives in Taos, I think that's how you pronounce it, New Mexico. Enjoy today's riveting interview. Molly, it is so great to have you here. Insatiable listeners, you guys are going to love this interview. I first met Molly a couple, several years ago, I think now. Time goes by so fast. But Molly, what I love about you is you've got what we think of as the woo, right? (laughs) The astrology. (laughs) But you're also very mathematical and I guess the the word evidence-based with it. And you have a systems background. So I love people who can bridge the worlds and explain to us Westerners how the woo isn't so woo and is actually very practical. So I'm excited to talk to you today about how we can use astrology in our health. Thanks for being here. <laughs> oh gosh, I'm so excited to be here, Allie. Yeah, it's been it's been a few years now. We've been having some good conversations over these years. 
But yeah, I'm thrilled to, to talk about this subject. It's very near and very dear to my heart. So let's first, before we get into the four types and how it relates to people's health, can you, what I love is you have such a historic perspective. How was astrology originally used in medicine? I don't think most people realize this. I know I did, and I learned it from you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The, the history of, of any of the esoteric arts Um, or most of them, has really been wiped out of our collective history. And so, yeah, most people have no idea. (laughs) And so partly what happened is that the tradition of astrology is, is very old. And you know, well, it goes back thousands of years, but certainly was in primary usage even through the Greek times. So Plato, Aristotle, I mean, they were astrologers. And it, it's not like that was something that they would have like put on their resume as much as it's just part of how they saw the world. It was part of, it was like part of the water that they swam in. And so the tradition of astrology was really this system of understanding characteristics of the physical world. And, and of course, until the Enlightenment in the 1700s, 1600s, 1700s, the physical world was more than just the physical. It was everything. It was the spiritual, the emotional. So, And what so do you that, mean by that? What do you mean by that? It was the physical, was the well, emotional, so spiritual. People, I mean, if you read Greek writings, you know, of course, we can only read things through our own lens. And, you know, we're modern Western thinkers. But if you, you know, people that have made the efforts to go back and study even the Greek or Roman or what, any, anything, you know, the, the Islamic writings, you know, they had a very different worldview to what we have. And they assumed that it was obvious that there was a spirit and that there was a whole person had more than just physical going on. Mm. And so it's really kind of like, you know, when you go back and study history, one of the first things you always have to do is is understand the differences between that culture and the one that you're in right now so that you can start to recognize the own, the water that you're swimming in so that you can compare it to the water they swam in. So that's kind of the, at, at core, that's the basics there. Yeah, that strikes me as so interesting because I think America, I know religion as a whole is is decreasing, but America is so centered around Christianity, right? Our calendar is based on that, the major holidays we get off. And yet when you go to the doctor, they're not going to say, what's going on in your soul? Like they, they... Exactly. And that's, and that's what the Enlightenment was all about. So during the Enlightenment, kind of again, 16, 1700s, what we did is we went, oh gosh, we have science now. We can measure stuff. And so, you know, the church and state split. And church got to have... Huh? In theory, they're supposed to be. Well, you know, but, but there was a fundamental shift that happened during the Enlightenment. And, you know, my, my astrology teacher sometimes uses that word, the Enlightenment, as kind of a tongue-in-cheek because there are some, they threw the baby out with the bathwater. And what they did was basically they went, okay, if it has to do with your soul or faith, you know, obviously that's the, the realm of the church. And, you know, modern medicine and modern science became in that, in that world that was developing, it was all about the body as a machine and the universe as a machine and everything was measurable and um, human bodies are the same. And so, you know, we would look at symptoms and then we know the diagnosis because it's, you know, everybody's the same. And, you know, at that point, uh, up until that point, just like, you know, gosh, the Chinese have Chinese traditional medicine, um, acupuncture, those, that's a whole body system where they have body types and they identify the body type before that they understand what their treatment's going to be. Similar to the Indian system of Ayurveda, kind of, again, a body type system where they want to understand who you are before they're going to give any recommendations or even really any diagnosis. The Western world did have a holistic system like that. And that is the system. I mean, sometimes it's called the four temperaments, the four humors, I call it the four elements. You know, we're talking about earth, water, fire, and air. And so up until the 16, 1700s, any person who was a learned person, who was an educated person, that is the system that they used to understand the physical environment. So yeah, people from Plato and Aristotle up through Galileo and Copernicus and all these great thinkers that, that we you know, maybe re- remember hearing their names in history class, they all use this holistic Western system of understanding these four different ways of being in the world. 
And they did have this idea that everything in the world was made up of either water, fire, air, or water. And of course, once we moved into modern science, we went, oh God, that's preposterous. And you know, we have atoms and we have protons and we've got this, that, and the other. And so they threw that completely out. And part of, part of what was in that system, that four element system, was this idea that, if, that, that at the very core we're made of essence, which is this kind of um, non-physical stuff that is, that's our soul and our spirit. And that comes first, and then our physical body comes. And that when we are in the world, we could look at any a chair, a plant, a person, and we could go, gosh, that thing has lots of water or it has lots of air. And there were very specific definitions of those terms. And so we weren't just thinking about them like, oh gosh, you know, if you put, if you had a bowl and you put in some earth and you put in some air, you'd come up with this thing. <laughs> there were, it was more that they were descriptors. There were specific definitions to those terms and what we were talking about. And so there started to be like, okay, we're describing an item. We're describing a person or a plant. We're not necessarily defining them. So it was more like a metaphor rather than yeah, kind literal. Of, I, mean, I would say even more than metaphor. I mean, they felt like they were talking about the real thing. Like, okay, gosh, that that rose has um, some fire. It has those thorns. Those thorns are fiery. They're, so again, fire in their world would have been dry and expressive. So there's these ways in which you start to look at just the definitions. And we'll talk about that a little bit more and it probably in a few minutes, but just the idea that, that then there, so they would have attributed, you know, they would have said, oh gosh, there's lots of Mars in a rose. Cause that's, you know, that's this prickly thing. And then there's lots of Venus, you know, water, you know, gosh, connection, merging, um, beauty, which emerges and nice smells, you know, with the flower, they're, pr- they're beautiful. So that immediately we're talking about, so they're kind of these ways that they would like look at it and be trying to understand what it was based on the characteristics that it had and how they could like identify something. And so that way of thinking really evaporated when we, when we said, no, it's essence doesn't exist. We only have the physical world. And if it's not measurable, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. And so we sort of really separated things out. And it meant that for the human body, all human bodies were the same. And if it wasn't acting correctly, that meant that there was a problem that needed to be, you know, fixed versus this idea that, well, gosh, in the first place, you have these different ways of being, and we have to understand which way we're dealing with to begin with before we're, you know, so do you see how they're kind of different? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, you know, I look, when I see the kind of results my clients get, when we really focus on the emotional and physical, when it comes to weight struggles and the, their relationship to food and what they eat, they, once they see it, see what's invisibly there or the essence of what's driving them to battle food, it's like, they can't unsee it. And they're like, why isn't everyone talking about this? And I'm like, I know, I think in 30 years, we will look back and say, can you believe they used to think weight was just about calories in, calories out. Like how preposterous, right? Like we've, totally. almost, had to, we've almost had to swing to the complete other end of the spectrum to get contrast to say, this is not working. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan that every modality has a place under the sun. And so, yeah, to me, it's, it's like, gosh, you know, thank God we have modern medicine or else there's lots of people that would die in car accidents. Right, um, right. You know, but having said that, when we do get into chronic health and everyday life and especially preventative health, there, there are certainly things that we can start to look at our own. I mean, it, you know, you see it in the popularity of all the, um, like, blood type, you know, diets, or, you know, there, there are a lot of like even modern Western ways of thinking that are kind of start to get close to looking at body type and, and understanding, you know, like what are the factors that are at play that, ma- that do actually make me fundamentally different than you. Yeah. And though like the blood type or the Ayurvedic, t- like the books that I've read when I was like trying to find answers, they don't really address the emotional, right? Or that, that physic, the emotional essence. And, and they think it's separate than the physical when I've just come to believe they're intertwined and the same thing. So yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, and I know I'm not a big, like I'm not a big expert on Ayurveda, so I can't speak to that whole lot. I do know a little bit more about the Chinese system. And I would say in the Chinese system, there is a recognition, you know, that there is a personality, that there are emotional, that there are emotional patterns that go along with gosh, you know, overactive, like if the liver meridian is overactive, there are certain things you're going to notice in the personality. But yeah, I think it's, you know, I just think the modern world is in general has muted that and tamped it down. And especially considering, you know, again, 
gosh, us Westerners, we are, we've taken even the Chinese system out of its own context as Westerners. So we're not still getting even what they, and frankly, you know, when the revolution happened in China, a lot of the Chinese system was actually taken apart by Chairman Mao because he wanted it, he wanted the religious parts of it taken out. So even, even their system has gone through in the last hundred, you know, hundred years. I'm not big up on my dates for Chinese, the Chinese resolution. I didn't even know there was one where this happened. (laughs) Right? (laughs) That's amazing. I learned so much from you. Oh my God. So getting back to the four types, which was, let's talk about those four types. But then you also, I love the example of the rose. You also said Mars and Venus. So when people think of astrology, I think they, when I, before I, got to know you and work with you. I didn't even, I had heard of the four types, but didn't understand that that was connected to astrology. So we explain the four types. Yeah. So basically if we go back to this, you know, and and it's funny, the modern medicine likes to kind of discount the four types. Oh gosh, they used to put leeches on people and like, you know, bleed them. And it's like, well, gosh, Chinese acupuncturists still bleed people every once in a while. Like they're happy if they put a needle in you and sometimes a little bit of blood comes out. That like, that is information for them. And so, you know, again, we kind of end up with these soundbite ideas, but back in the day with the four types, what, the, what it was this idea that, again, there's these four basic ways of being in the world and that each, each thing, and we'll talk about humans now, each human has all four in, in them, but we've each got our own little recipe. And so some people are really well balanced, but some people have, you know, a lots of air or lots of fire. And so by looking at how that human being operates and how they're working emotionally, as well as how their body actually is, we can start to understand the patterns in that, in that body. And again, then we can start to, to diagnose and to actually treat. So if we look at the four elements, I'll just, I'll run through them briefly. I, you guys are going to have access to a, a little PDF that's going to kind of break things down if you want to go back and look. Yeah, it'll um, be in the show notes at Alice Yeah, it'll be in the show notes. Dot com so, backslash podcast, just so that yeah. people can get that. <laughs> Yay. So the first one we'll talk about is air. So air in the tradition was called the sanguine. And you'll hear people even still use that term. Oh, somebody's sanguine. They're really, they're talkative or they're very kind of thoughtful, you know, like um, use thoughtful, not in this, in the sense of being like slow or quiet, but thoughtful in the sense of, you know, like lots of ideas. So the sanguine, they primarily are about thinking and communicating. And, and so they do live in the world and it's air, it's, it's higher. It's, it's the kind of the, the world up there, you know, Oh, somebody's in the clouds. And so I'll run just really quickly through each of them. The fire, of course, used to be called the choleric. And so, gosh, I was watching a, a Netflix TV show the other day um, about the, Revo- the American Revolution, and there was somebody in there saying, well, they're obviously a choleric person. And I was like, you know, yeah, we still, every once in a while, we hear that term come out. And it means that that person is really fiery. They're primarily focused on doing and acting. They're, they're not thoughtful. They're not like going to, you know, plan it out ahead of time. They're just going to jump in. Would that be the word spontaneous? <laughs> yeah, you could be. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, again, with each of these, keeping in mind that there there is positive sides of this and kind of quote unquote negative sides of this. There are ways that these qualities can be really helpful, and sometimes they're not so helpful. So you know, there's this is this is kind of real life. So there's both positives and negatives. <laughs> and sometimes people can have not enough of one of these things. So like with fire, you know, gosh, courage, initiating, hardworking, vision, action, you know, those are things that we would say are positive, but you can then also have arrogance, aggressiveness, impatience, and too much dogma among other, among other, among other things, you know, with the air, you know, social freedom, flexibility, information, thinking are all things that you could attach to air. But then you would also put maybe aloof or shallow or flaky or inconsistent or too idealistic. So again, you can see how there's, you know, can be a little too much, not enough, all that kind of good stuff. The other two elements are water and earth. So briefly, water was called the phlegmatic. You know, lots of phlegm. (laughs) Yeah, lots of liquid, right? When we're babies, we go through our phlegmatic phase, right? Lots of liquid coming out of all the orifices. (laughs) But water, of course, is the feelings, the desire nature. And so people who have a lot of water can be empathetic or nurturing, responsive. Water has the most cohesion of any of the elements. So, you know, that desire to bond. 
But then when there's too much, there can be sloth, drama, depression, reactivity. You can be conflict avoidance, you know, not wanting to break that cohesion. With the earth, the fourth one, that's the melancholic. And so those, the earth just wants to contemplate, just wants to be. That's me. I just yeah, want I know. To it's contemplate. totally me too. I have a lot of earth. <laughs> And, and so it is, it's a thinking, but it's not so much trying to figure out like the sanguine, you know, it's not so much focused on facts and figures and, you know, information and news or fake news like the sanguine, the air, but it is the earth. It just wants to be, just wants to be in the body and notice. So it just kind of wants to understand that there is a pragmatism to the earth. So it's observant, thoughtful, strategic, steady, pragmatic. But you'd have to watch for stubborn, anxious, worrying, being boring, procrastination, all the, you know, kind of not wanting to move. So I feel are- like you just described me. I'm so stubborn. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm totally melancholy. <laughs> I think I'm a big of, w- w- wait, what was that last one? Earth. Earth with a big water in the middle, phlegm in the uh-huh. middle. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and so it's interesting, like there's a way in which you can start to break them down, you know, both water and earth are inward, which means that they're, you know, receptive, there's an inward focus, whereas both air and fire are outward, they're expressive. And you can kind of break it up also with hot and cold, both air and excuse me, both are not hot and cold. We just did the hot is the outward and expressive and and cold is inward and receptive. If you kind of think about it, the hot, you know, it's things start to move around a lot more and cold things kind of come to stillness. But then we can also look at it in the dry and moist. That's another, the other kind of coin. And so dry is separating and defining. And so that's fire and earth and air and water are both moist. They're connective. And again, when you look at the little cheat sheet, you you can kind of see it laid out visually. But so each of the elements has, is either hot or dry and it's either moist or cold. And, or no, it's kind of, see, I get them mixed up when I start talking. (laughs) In my mind, they all make sense. But anyhow, so, you know, would that that translate into like Western terms of today's, like when you're too fiery or dry is inflammation versus if you're super congested and phlegmy, you're too watery. It it can be, although here's one of the kind of the glitches and anybody who has experienced acupuncture and has actually gotten to talk with their acupuncturist will probably relate to this. You don't necessarily just look at the symptoms. So somebody who's having inflammation, while clearly there's a fire symptom going on there, the root cause might be lack of water, might be a kidney issue. And so, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to take, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just always take the symptom and then equate it with what there is lacking or too much of. That makes Um, sense. And because then you, you start to get into the complexity of medicine and, and certainly the tradition of medicine where, but, you know, there, there's just, there's a whole, there's a, there's a lot, of, a lot of other factors, but to start to notice, I mean, I would always encourage, you know, when we have a dry cough, you know, gosh, too much earth, right? Too much dryness and coldness. We can't, you know, I think when people are, you know, think about when you go to the tropics, you know, you're sweating and it's hot and you kind of, you know, you want cucumber, you want things that are cold, like cucumbers that you don't want, you know, you don't necessarily want a hot, spicy chili, although sometimes you do. So you can start to see all these complexities and contradictions if you look really closely. And I think initially what is helpful is just to kind of start to notice. Are you somebody who often has a runny nose? Are you somebody who often like it has a hard time sweating when you exercise? You know, just starting to notice like hot and cold and moisture and dryness, like how your body operates can just be an initial swipe at it. Are you somebody who is thirsty a lot, you know, or do you just, are you thirsty even though you're drinking a lot of water? You know, just starting to notice your body's patterns can be the first step. Do you find that most people have like one or two dominant types that they, or one person, or is it different for every person? I'm just wondering for listeners how they can start to yeah, you know, categorize themselves. Yeah. And, and so it's interesting One, you know, yes and no, I, you know, I've looked at a lot of charts <laughs> over the years and it's, a, it's an interesting to me how many people are actually fairly well balanced that do have air, fire, water, and earth going on in, in almost equal measure. 
Now, when I look at a chart, it is one of the things I'm looking at is, is that temperament is, are you more of a fiery person or are you more of an, of a watery person? And for a lot of people, there is, I gosh, I don't know, maybe, maybe 60% of the people, there is one of those that really stands out. And often what happens is it's a matter of looking at what part of the life are you looking at? You know, how do you begin things? How do you end things? Are you, how do you do the work of a thing? And that's where you can, like some people, like I'm, I'll use myself and as, as an example, I start things in a watery way. I'm very intuitive and I'm very like, I need to understand how I feel about, and I know my feelings about a thing, like before I even know what it, the thing is. And so I approach things in a watery manner, but when I'm getting into the work of a project or a relationship or a job or, you know, anything, I, I do tend to get into kind of a fiery earthy thing where I, I want to, I want to have a task list. I want to be doing, I want to be in action. And I also like to research. I want to get deeply into something and that's kind of the earthy piece. So, so I would just say like, it's hard sometimes to make general sweeping general. There's very few people that you can say, Oh my gosh, fire all the time. You know, our current commander in chief is pretty close to being fire all the time. Um, although he has a lot of air in him as well. Hot and we see that, right? You know, the people that love him, love him because he's, you know, in action. And the people that hate him, hate him because he's being, you know, in aggressive. In <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, and, and the communication, right? He's, he's, you know, flaky and consistent, idealistic. You know, I mean, you can kind of start to apply some of those air. Or you could say, gosh, he's a great communicator. He's always telling us what he thinks. So, again, depending on... He's if you nihilistic? Like him. Huh? Do you think he's a nihilistic? Like I didn't listen to his inauguration speech because I couldn't. I thought I would. I, you know, I have. I don't listen. I I, I will say I don't listen to a lot. Carlos of Carlos listened to it. I came in that day and he was like, "Oh my god!" He's like, "That was the darkest thing I've ever heard." Like so, you know, remnant of like what Hitler would do. And mm-hmm. well, and he's got a lot of fire, you know. So yes, he's he he's very, you know. It's just it's just that's the you know we we've come off of having somebody. Our past president was very airy, but uh, had a good amount of earth too. And he certainly had some fire. There are certainly things that our past president was doing that I would say would absolutely be couched in total fire reactions to things, <laughs> his drone program. But I think, you know, generally speaking, we thought of him as somebody who was a slower speaker, who would kind of take his time when he was talking. And that's kind of a real kind of melancholic characteristic. Do you find, I mean, I know gender socialized, but do you find, because I think one of the things that when I think about leadership is does each culture have an expectation of what that leadership will look and sound like? And then when you, as a gen, if you're a female or someone who tends to be more contemplative, Mm -hmm. less reactive. I remember when, when I was doing communications for a company and I was in the, the Paris office and I had to write stuff for the CEO of, of Europe and same data, but the American CEO was like, gave a completely different version and tone of events of like, we can do it. And that's one of the things I love about Americans. So optimistic, sometimes too optimistic. Mm-hmm. The American CEO was like, we've got this. We're a little behind, but we can do it because of this, this very fiery. And the French CEO was very pragmatic, a little bit like, you know, so I just wonder if each culture has a different expectation for what leadership looks and sounds like. Oh, absolutely. And again, I mean, we're talking in generalizations now, and I always like to remind people, you know, when we're talking in generalizations, they are just that. And we always then have to go to the specifics to find out what our actual information is. Yes. So I always just want to remind people that, you know, specifics and generalizations each have a place. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, cultures, you know, that's what is so fascinating to me about different cultures. You know, I'm somebody who's studied, I've got a master's in behavioral science. And so we did a lot of study of different cultures. And there's, you know, high, high context cultures like the Japanese, where you have to really understand the whole system before you understand what they're saying to each other. I mean, they can, they can blink at each other and they've just communicated. And there's so, there's so many kind of unspoken rules. It's a very, what's called a very high context culture. Whereas America, you know, there is no, like nobody has, it sometimes is, is, is very little that's the same. You know, we are such a melting pot, truly, that you do have to do a lot of explaining. And, you know, as Americans, we do do a lot of communicating more than a lot of other cultures that don't have those cohesive um, rules that everybody's kind of playing along with. 
So yeah, culture, I mean, you really do have to, again, context. I always say to people, you know, systemic thinking means that we're always, always, always looking at the context of a thing. Yeah, no, um, I love that. Because whenever someone asks me like a question when I speak or whatever, I'm like, it depends. And it's-, it's all Yeah, it totally depends. And I mean, I think that's where the more we can, I always encourage people, you know, do pay attention to the phases of, you know, are you at the beginning, middle or end of a thing? You know, that's a great way to understand behavior is, are you beginning something? Are you in the middle of it? Or are you ending it? Well, and I think those are great questions for people, what you talked about, how you work. Like, how do you start mm-hmm. something? How do you actually engage with the thing, which is, which is what Molly's calling it? And how do you end something? It can start to give you clues to your overall temperament. And especially when we're talking about medical stuff, is it an acute issue or a chronic issue? I mean, again, starting to think about, you know, when something, you know, gosh, especially I know a lot of your people have come to you because they've done a lot of dieting. Okay, so how do you do diets? Are you somebody who rushes in or are you thoughtful before you start a diet? You know, like what's, again, no wrong or right here, just we're trying to identify what your patterns are. You know, and so to, to, you know, to one of the things you just mentioned about kind of the female, the female leadership versus maybe male and again, generalizations, you know, of course we take that into account in the astrology. Interestingly, I'll talk about age first. So, and I mentioned it earlier, babies, of course, are water and adolescents kind of, you know, gosh, 11, 12, 13, maybe through mid twenties, I would say like late twenties, even you won't be surprised to hear is a fire time of your life, right? The acne, the like gung ho ness, that's, that's your fire time. And then that adult, which is kind of, you know, like say late twenties through into gosh, 50s, 60s, 70s, depending on the life is really the air. And again, what are we doing there in that time? We're communicating, we're exchanging, we're kind of being out in our lives doing that both part of exchange in our life. And then the final part of our life, the last, you know, I would say 60s and on, again, though it depends, each person's different, is the earth part, right? We get smaller, we shrink, we get drier, you know, our skin is not as, you know, moist. So we get more earthy, we get more melancholic, we come into our wisdom, and yes, the, the melancholic is the seed of the wisdom, although it obviously takes all three. So people that are super melancholic are not always like, you know, you don't just want to like take and eat what they say whole. <laughs> Never do that with anybody. <laughs> I know, totally, right? But yeah, so it, keep in that sort of way of thinking about generalized thinking, because human beings are social, so fundamentally human beings are social, they are moist. Men then are airy, so kind of very, very generalized men are airy there because that's hot and moist. So they're outward, they're expressive and women are watery. So they're inward. And so that it's like the, the water is the cold and moist. So inward and connective. And so again, generally speaking, um, women are water and men are, are, are airy. And so when we look at gender differences, you know, I think, again, it's just about looking at the differences. I, I mean, and, and specifically, of course, there are people who blow that right out of the water. But of course, women are the nurturers. That's because they're more, they tend to be more watery. They do tend to be, in a generalized way, more inward than your average, you know, your average female versus your average male. Men are communicators. They want to be out in the world and, and kind of we look at human history. And again, if we lay patriarchy over that, you know, or matriarchy, we can see nuances. But, you know, your average guy is going to be more outwardly oriented and, you know, kind of all the horrible stereotypes of guys is that they can't, you know, they don't know their feelings, right? Unless you marry a writer like I do. (laughs) So again, you know, keeping very, very, very broad brush strokes right there. You know, when we look at brush and when we look, like when I look at a birth chart, I I do not consider gender because that level of generalization is, is unnecessary. When I was even thinking about like with a woman's uh, menstrual cycle, right? Like the first, the, the week after you bleed, those first two weeks are more like fiery and you're out in the world. Mm-hmm. And then the third week, because with the hormonal changes, because you also need to adapt your food, mm-hmm. uh, the third week is more introspective, probably more earthy. And then the last week where you're, it's like death kind of, or I guess it would be earth. on the Yeah, I mean, you're, so you are following the, the moon cycle, you know? And yeah. so the first quarter at, at the new moon and up to the first quarter, that's the air, right? Yeah. It's the voice, then it's the communication. Then that, that's, from the first quarter to the full moon is the fire, right? Out in the world. So that first half is the outward half. And then after the full moon, so that third week is the earth. 
So that's that contemplative and being inward. And then that final is the, is the phlegmatic. It's the watery. It's the fourth quarter of the moon, which is about being inward and letting go. So yeah, of course. I mean, like that just is amazing. (laughs) That pattern like, it's throughout, it's throughout our, our physical environment. I mean, the, the fours and threes are, I mean, fours, threes, sevens, twelves. It's throughout almost all of the, I mean, it's, it, it's patterns that, and again, that's not saying that astrology rules things. It's saying that astrology is simply true, just like all these other ways of being are true. Right. Well, I always, well, and I like that you use the word true, because for me, truth has to be cut across privilege, gender. Mm-hmm culture, class. It's not just for a select. And time. It cuts across time. time. It cuts across those patterns you'll see in a lot of indigenous cultures. A lot. I mean, you'll see the, those, the four, three, seven, twelve, you see, I mean, not all of them, of course, but you see across, across culture and across time. What do and you that's mean by the seven and 12? I'm still in awe. So, seven, so the seven is the four plus three and the 12 is the four times three. So that's why sevens and twelves, you know, we have 12 months. We have, you know, I mean, it's, it's all, you know, it's just the structure of the universe. Cause I'm still like in awe of the, the moon cycle, the menstrual cycle, the Mm -hmm. child, the, the cycles of our lives. I'm like, cause I always want to believe that some there's, there is an organizing force. Like that's what my quest is to figure out. And it makes me feel like there is an organized force. If we see these patterns Mm -hmm. consistently, how brilliant and amazing is that? Well, yeah, and it's interesting, you know, it's, it's like if you go into Ayurveda, they have three types, but really those are all combo types. And if you go into Chinese medicine, they have five types. And again, there's like a fifth type that's kind of what, what the Western world would call the ether. So again, it, like it all can overlay. I mean, they're not like, and you know, my, I never have worked with a lot of Indian astrologers, Vedic astrologers is what they're called. They work in the geodish, but my teacher had known a couple of good friends that had, and you know, they would do their own systems. And I, I think you can't mix the systems. That's where you get into trouble. And there's a lot of people out there that are trying, Oh, you can do this out of that system and that out of that. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like, you can't speak. Past, I mean, you know, Spanglish, you know, right. It doesn't really work so well or I mean you know whatever but that reminds me of Carlos is Portuguese but his parents lived in Venezuela before they mm-hmm. immigrated they, they immigrated from Portugal to Venezuela then to Newark New Jersey and he grew up thinking he was speaking Portuguese but then when he went to undergrad and majored in Portuguese they're like this is not <laughs> Portuguese and it was a mixture of Spanish and Portuguese and he had to like unlearn everything mm-hmm. to, like, relearn it so yeah, yeah actually so you can be creative there, right? It can be a source of creation, but at the same time to understand the root of a thing, you have to go back to its pure form uh, oftentimes to understand where it came from. And so, yeah, I think anyhow, my, my teacher would work with it and then they would come up with the same answers on charts and stuff. If, you know, if they would start because the sky is me- measured differently in geodish versus um, Western astrology. And there, you know, like, for example, there's a time where people would say, oh gosh, you know, the American the, or the Western tradition, I mean, it's, they're not even measuring the sky properly. And so the geodish of course is correct. And it's like, well, no, there's just a couple of different ways of measuring it is all. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I, I do want to get into like the planets, but first let's talk about the, and how they connect with the, the temperaments mm-hmm. or the four, four types, but let's talk about how people can, when the seasons change, cause we're in summer right now. Yeah. I, remember, I mean, it's a great, yeah, go ahead. Well, because you know, I remember everyone saying like summer is the easiest time to stay healthy. And I always found it to be really challenging because I, it's just like those, that heat just makes me not want to move. It makes me crabby. So how can we use knowing our type with the season we're in, both the, the season of the calendar and the season of our life? I'd love to. Yeah. Wonderful. I, you know, exactly. So part of it again is understanding your general propensities and, you know, uh, Ali and I were talking a little bit before the, the call and I, we were starting to talk a little bit about not only calendar seasons, but also season of life. So, and, and that maybe partially refers to what I mentioned earlier about adolescent versus adult versus elder. But I think more appropriately for this conversation, it's really when we're going through transitions in our lives, where are you at in that transition? Are you in the water part where you're letting go of things? Are you in the earthy part where you're contemplating and researching and just sitting with? Are you in a doing section of your life where you're out like just being in, in, in the fire part? Or are you in an air part where you're, 
you know, there's a, certainly an element of doing in, in air, but it's more about in ideas and expression and communicating. So part of it is really understanding where you're at in your own life, in addition to understanding how you generally tend to be. So those, both of those things, it's kind of like you're doing almost a little bit of math here, you know, a little bit of earth plus a little bit of air. You know? And I just sort of just say to people, don't get too crazy about it. Don't get too Virgo about it. Just kind of broad brush strokes. Where do you feel? And usually most people are able to say within a couple of minutes, you know, if they feel like they're, you know, kind of what phase they feel like they're in. So you know, I would say just again, broad brush strokes there. And then, yeah, what climate, what type of climate do you live in? But do you live in a climate like the Pacific Northwest that tends to be very wet? Do you live in a climate like the Midwest that tends to be drier or the Southwest that tends to be very fiery and earthy? And then, yes, what season are we in? So what, what is the East Coast? I would- you, know, I, you know, I think I have given this a lot of thought. I think it, it really depends on season. I mean, obviously the summer is very airy. It's very hot and moist. Yeah. But winter, it seems like, can be watery or earthy. Yeah. I loved how, because when we were working together and I was trying to figure out, like, where should I move to? You were talking about how Philly is very, we have a lot of listeners in Philly and New York. Philly is very earth and watery. So it's like, Mm -hmm. and then New York is very earth and fiery. And I love thinking about, like, cities because when I come back from New York, I feel like, oh, what just happened? Versus when I come back from Philly, I'm like, oh, that was great because it's totally in tune with Philly's, Philly's temperament is totally in tune with mine versus totally. when I go to New York. So think about that from, from a city and when you're traveling, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, you know, this is the water that I swim in. So I'm always thinking about like, and sometimes I don't know, you know, sometimes I, I can look at, again, identify characteristics rather than trying to define wholly. And to me, you know, like to me, a city might be different than to another person. So again, it's, it's so subjective when we're just talking about it on this level. But I encourage people to just, again, what you're doing is you're observing. And so to, to spend some time just kind of contemplating, what do I notice? Do I notice that it's more moist? And so again, spring is air. I should probably add the seasons onto this worksheet, although this is the intake, uh, part of my intake process. So I, seasons don't usually come into it, but of course, spring is air, summer is fire. And then the autumn is earth. Cause of course we're reaping the benefits, right? We're harvesting. So that's stuff. So that's earth. And then that final season, the winter is water where we're just being inward and being receptive. So, you know, I would, encourage people to pay attention to the season and how they experience the season. I mean, if you're somebody for whom summer is difficult, yeah, you need to do things to cool yourself. So you're adding moisture. So if you look, and this is where you can kind of look at on the, on the worksheet, if you look at fire, it says hot and dry. Okay. So if, if, if I experience summer as being too much, gosh, I want more moisture and I want more connection and I want more coolness. I want to be more inward. And so, you know, if summer's too hot and, you know, outward, yeah, it's time for you to stay in a cool room during the heat of the day, you know, working inside, eating cool things, cucumbers, you know, lots of water, um, salads that are cool, maybe not so many chilies. You know, so it's, you know, it really depends, you know, and I think that's, but I think it's what the key, key here is, here's like a, it's a system where you can just start to pay attention Gosh, you know, in the tradition, they, they actually had, you know, food as medicine, they would act, would be very specific about the foods you would eat, depending on what ailment you were experiencing and depending on season, because, and partly, you know, back in those days, they didn't have refrigeration. So there was only the the foods of that season available typically, but it kind of worked. And, and I think there is some some wisdom there about understanding you know eating seasonally does make a lot of sense and interestingly of course in the summertime you do have a lot of watery like watermelon and fruit and things with a lot of water in them actually are available to counterbalance that that fire and interestingly you don't have all those watery vegetables and fruits available to you in the winter time when you are in an, an, a, when you generally have more water around you anyhow and don't so much need it yeah, I I want to say two things about that for everyone listening. Like in general, Mother Nature has got your back. Like she's totally. doing all the work. <laughs> and yeah. so like, this is when I cringe when I see people like t- raw foodies who live in Hawaii telling people on the East Coast in the dead of winter <laughs> that raw food works for them. And again, maybe it does if your body's super overheated and, and you're fiery. However, Mother Nature in general, eating seasonally, 
She's got your back. Second of all, this is why it's so important to know what foods work best for you because what Molly's talking about is very subtle things that you can pick up on, but you can't pick up on the subtlety if you, if your blood sugar is out of whack, if you're always inflamed because of your gut health. So really under, knowing your body and what works for you makes it, you start with a very calm, in tune space vessel. And these subtle things become so much easier to pick up on. So I just kind of wanted to put that kind of background plug in. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, the best way to this is, is everything that, that Allie's talking about, paying attention and experimenting. And I know sometimes there are, I mean, Allie and I both have a lot of earth, so it's easy for us to experiment because we have that, like, we want to research and we want to be patient. And I recognize that there's a lot of people out there who simply are not that patient, <laughs> and who don't like doing research and who don't want to like be systematic, systematic about their, their experimentation. I get that. And that's information, right? So mm. if you're somebody who's more airy or more fiery and you're like, Oh no, uh -uh, I want freedom. Like I don't want to tie down or no, I just like to go do it, you know, honor that and then pay it, you know, but, but I would say still, you can kind of still be paying attention a little bit. And, and I would also say though that I, I love freedom. It's one of my biggest values, but I, can, I am free because I understand the system of my body. So it's totally. kind of like the tension of opposites there. Yep. Yep. You told, yeah, for sure. And so I just think a lot of it's, 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 it's paying attention and experimenting. And I always tell people, you know, so when you're in this and especially thinking about the seasons, be thinking about the season of the calendar, the climate that you tend to be in. And if you're somebody who has moved, it's, it's worthwhile taking some time to think about how your diet may have changed because of that move, you know, above and beyond the fact that maybe you moved from a big city to a small town and, you know, your favorite Thai food is just not available anymore. <laughs> um, God, I can relate to that one. Big <laughs> but, but more than that, like, you know, how did you notice you get headaches at different times now that you live in a different climate or do you notice you're hungry for different types of foods in different seasons? So again, and, and sometimes this inquiry is something that takes a couple of years. I think it's, you know, you, you may experience a little bit of frustration, like, oh, oh I don't know. And I want to know. And again, there's this like, you know, it's, it'll, you can take this through a year easily and just start to like make some notes in a book about what you notice. And once you start to notice, it will become more obvious. You can also, I found this, I worked with Molly as I was going through a transition. I knew I needed to leave Philly. I, I didn't know why. I, I love it there. And I knew I needed a change. And just needed some some sort of experience to awaken me to my own knowing and, and organize what I was going through. And, and Molly reading my chart was so helpful because it's not, we'll get into this now, the planets. It's not, you know, I'm a Libra with a Taurus rising, but I didn't realize it was so much more complex than just that. It's kind of like people talking about nutrition, like it's just calories in, calories out. That's kind of what like modern, what we read about astrology in the newspaper or these magazines but really understanding your patterns, which Molly can help you do, can save you a lot of time. So just yeah, a for I mean, Molly's work. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. You know, I think one of the things, you know, and it's not even just mine, you know, I, I would say, yeah, and, and I, you know, I begrudgingly will admit that there are a lot of modern astrologers that, that do get past the, these Virgo, Pisces, you know, kind of boxes. So I'm not, I'm not always completely down on modern astrologers, although... I am a little bit, you know, so that's I'm not down with modern even, nutrition. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Quote modern well, it's nutrition. Not so much then, it's just that the system got so um, kind of bastardized um, during the Enlightenment. I um, mean, there's a lot of politics, a fascinating history of astrology there as a really, it ended up being a, at the mercy of government and the church. And, you know, us traditional astrologers would love to get our hands on the Vatican Library because all the good astrology books we know are in there. Really? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, it's so obvious that the church as well as, you know, gosh, all the royal families are still using traditional astrologers to set wedding dates and to set but anything that they can you know, anything that where a date needs to be set, it's like, oh, God, they're totally still electing those dates. So um, just why because don't they want... No why didn't they want us, the common proletariat, to? Because <laughs> it's information and it works. Oh. They don't, and they don't want that, you know. So you want to be able to be controlled? Is, is yeah, that of course. That's power and control. That's just human nature, right? Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a fascinating history there. And really, that's why astrology got discounted was because it was really a pawn during the Enlightenment when church and, separ and, ch when church and state were separating. And the church was like, you know, it was a big power grab went on in the 17, 1800s. 
and like late 1600s. And, you know, all of everybody consulted astrologers because they used astrology for medicine. They used it. I mean, that's just, again, it was the way that they could describe their environment. So they didn't think of it as the woo-woo thing that we think of it now because it was just part of how they went through their life. Just like we would watch a weather report or a financial report or read the newspaper. That's how they did astrology. It was just part of their life. And so when the church started to lose power, they discounted all the astrologers so that they could start to get some of their power back. And, you know, they've done a very successful, you know, gosh, 400 year marketing campaign against astrology. It's been very effective. And for a while, astrology um, prediction was actually illegal. You could die if you were caught predicting. And so, you know, needless, needless to say, you know, it went away for a little while. And when it came back a couple hundred years ago, um, the people that reintroduced it into the society, it was just considered entertainment. They stripped the whole system out of all of its, all of its symmetry and its beauty and all of the really useful predictive tools that existed were all taken out of the system. And what was left was this kind of ABC system where the house equals the, the sign equals that planet. So like first house equals Mars equals Aries. No, that's not how astrology is structured. That, this reminds me of nutrition. It's like, let's strip mm-hmm. out the, the beauty of the soil. Let's not talk about how the food's produced. Like, let's just, let's just reduce it to calories. And like, mm-hmm. then you, people will eat health bars and and food that they think they have to eat to be healthy. So then you don't really understand the full agency or power you have over your health. Well, yeah. Process. Well, yeah. I mean, it's in, and so, you know, basically people, so they just turned it into entertainment so that it could, they could not die by doing it. And that's why, well, in nutrition, they turned it into just about dieting and weight. Yeah, basically. And so totally. And so it's like, you know, in astrology, like they, that's why astrology column is still in the entertainment section of a newspaper. I mean, that's still the reason why it's considered entertainment. You know, Um, once my clients get what, what develop what I call the boss mindset, which is like a different development in the adult plateau, adult development plateau, they basically feel like everything is, I'm like, everything's opposite day. Like you just have to look at everything now as like opposite day. So if it's in the entertainment, it's really serious. If it's <laughs> quote, totally. fake news, it's the entertainment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's amazing once you start to look at, you know, at how things really work. But yeah, I mean, basically, you know, it was obliterated for that reason. But, you know, when you look at an astrology chart, you know, you really aren't, you know, you're not looking. So I guess I always say to people, the best way to put this is modern astrology really is putting you like Myers Briggs or any of those systems into a box. Like I'm, I'm a Pisces, so I'm like this. And traditional astrology starts with the four elements for sure. That's definitely a core piece, but we're moving past that very, very quickly. And so traditional astrology, because it was a core piece of the way that people just had developed intellectual thought for you know, 1500 years. It's about identifying the particular. It's about identifying the unique. And so my work is really, yes, I'm using this language of Pisces, Virgo, Aries, but I'm very, very quickly trying to understand what's unique about you. Um, And that's why, you know, you're moving past, you know, your Taurus ascendant or your Libra sun you know, you're not a very Venusian. Both of those signs are ruled by Venus. You're not a very Venus person. You, you, you know, Mars is so much more active in your chart. And that be, starts to be revealed, you know, when we really look at your chart. And that's where I think the moderns, I always feel, kind of feel sorry for them. They're missing out on all the really cool tools because they're practicing modern astrology. And so they're not able to get to this stuff that's uh, other than, you know, I think there's a lot of astrologers out there that would say, oh, well, I'm, I just intuit the chart. It's like, well, yeah, that's because you're psychic. That's not astrology. <laughs> you know, one's a system and one's, and, and not to knock being psychic, it's obviously incredibly powerful, but there's, there's two different things. One's a system of delineation and one is a system of, you know, intu- in, intuition and connection to those non-physical worlds. And so what's the, what's the bridge from the four temperaments to the planets in terms of, I can, I want, when you, once you explain it, I want to explain the significance it had in my own health when I learned. Yeah. So partly there's two things. Partly is, you know, again, when we're looking at like, so one of the things I do when I look at a chart is I look, I do, I look at temperament and there's a way that you delineate temperament in an astrological chart. There are five points that you consider. Two of them, of course, are the sun and the moon. And people are like, oh, I have a Virgo sun. Great. It's an earth sign. No, Virgo sun is actually a fire placement because it's in the fire season. 
So one of the things is we're always looking at the four quadrants. So what is the phase of the moon that you were born in? Not the sign. The sign is always the adjective and the noun is, is, the, is the phase. So for sun and moon, it's always more important what the phase was. So for the sun, of course, that's the season you were born in. And for the moon, it's, yeah, what's the phase of the moon? And so you're looking at that. And that was one of the big things for you was you were born, your sun is in Libra. That's actually an earth placement. So you've got an airy, you know, your, your earthy moon has got, shows up in kind of an airy way. So your ability for, you know, or your, excuse me, your son, your, the sun is, you know, you're looking at the overview of the life. The, the sun is the light of the life. It's, it's the thing that you're focused on, regardless of whether you're in a relationship or at work or eating dessert. And um, so sun and Libra, really, that's a melancholic placement. That's an earthy placement. You're wanting to understand and to, to take in all that information. And the way that you do that is through information, that earthy piece or the, 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 airy, the Libra piece, the airy piece, yeah. you know, versus Scorpio, which would be like a watery way of wanting to understand all that information. Well, I also found, because when I came to you, I was very much in a composting <laughs> stage. Mm-hmm. I, I was ending a cycle, but I, you know, I mean, on this podcast, I often say like, I kind of poo-poo the love and light people who are only love and light. Mm-hmm. And I was really struggling because when I was still kind of thinking I was in the coaching field, which I'm not, I'm, it's it, what I'm doing is different, is there was all this love and light. And, and I was like, I don't understand how people are only talking about love and light. And you were like, well you know, your, the most prominent chart for you is Mars in, or planet for you is Mars and Scorpio. And Scorpio wants to get to the depths. Like it doesn't want to stay on the surface. And you talked about how my Mars and Scorpio was also like in the wounded part of Venus. Like you said, it wasn't like her favorite place to be. And, yeah. and it's like the wounded feminine. And even though I talk about food and health and, and bodies, ultimately what I'm taking people through is a heroine's journey, which is healing this yin archetype, both men and women. Mm-hmm on a very theoretical level. And that helped me just like be okay with my path rather than trying to fit into what I thought everyone wanted to hear or that I thought I had to be as a quote coach, which. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's why I love traditional astrology. It's, I mean, there is bad and good, you know, there are things that work and don't work, you know, Venus has a very difficult time in Scorpio and yeah, your Venus is in Scorpio as well. So it's, you know, it's Mars ruled, it's Mars territory. And um, how do you go through a deep swamp with a propeller, which is really a bunch of blades and blades are Mars. That's their, they cut. So um, Scorpio, the deep swamp is a Mars territory. And and so I think being able to see in each chart, like planet, so, you know, each of the planets fits into an element. And so, you know, for example, the sun is obviously fiery, as is Mars. Water is the realm of the moon. Earth is the realm of Saturn and Mercury. And air is the realm of Jupiter. Oh, and Venus is watery. And so, you know, generally, again, generally speaking, not always, because depending on where those, some of those planets are in relationship to the sun and the chart, it can change. So, you know, there's all these rules. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, once they start to go, oh yeah, there is this inner conflict in me. And I think so much of our, our, of the self help stuff that's out there, I think one of the downsides of it is there's always this, like, I need to fix myself. And if I fix myself, everything will be easy and easeful and wonderful and daiquiris on the beach. And that's true for a very, very small portion of people. For a lot of people out there, they do have these internal conflicts that really provide the tension that drives their life. And they're never going to be resolved. Now, you will mature and learn how to manage those tensions, right? And learn how to still be productive and, and, and give what you have to give in your life, hopefully. But, you know, I, I, so, I'm, I, so I'm, that's what I love about traditional astrology is it actually starts to like really, it's a tool for seeing the, just the basics of those relationships that we have inside of us. And especially then when we put it in the context of right now, we can go, oh, well, of course that served you when you were a little kid. Or yeah, you went through this phase where that was really helpful for you to be doing that activity. But now you're in this other phase and all of a sudden it's like not working anymore. And so it can shed light in a very like pragmatic way for me to kind of be able to say to you, hey, look, yeah, your, your Venus stuff, like the, the Scorpio is really strong for you. The Mars is really strong for you. So of course, the, you know, you, what you see is that wounded Venus stuff because that's what you're living. 
Yeah. And, and I like that because, and we were, you know, it helps you. I, I feel like when you know your chart in detail, the way that Molly can help, help you see is it helps you just own who you are in your own patterns and like accept that because, and, and Molly and I were talking about this before we started, like, I don't really think anybody else wants someone else's life. Like, no. I think we want our best lives and we all have different patterns that we are who we are. I mean, part of that struggle too was like, it took me so long to really put together the totality of my process because I was doing something that hadn't been done before, but because it was really deep, it took me a long time to understand and, and it felt like I should have been further ahead. But when mm-hmm. I learned about that, it was just like, it is what it is. Like, and, and I know totally. that phrase can be frustrating when you're struggling. And there's also a surrender that I think once we know our patterns more intensely or more deeply and intimately, that can relax you in a way. Mm-hmm. And again, that is so important for health to resolve that conflict between comparing yourself to other people versus this is my path. And, yep. and I've found with all of my clients is the more they get in touch with who they really are, they want their path because it's their path. And well, it's kind of a fun. They're usually fun because you're the yeah. one that's designed for it. So you're the one that like, I know I, I do this for myself all the time. Like I'm frustrated with something. I'm having a hard time. Like, for example, for me, the last couple of years have been very difficult and I've often had to go back to my own knowledge of my life and kind of be, you know, God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a moment of it. And to kind of understand, like, I do have a lot of earth. Things do move more slowly for me, which the downside is sometimes I get to, you know, sort of sit in the stew for maybe a little longer than other people. I've been trying to take uh, more fire action, knowing that I'm... Yeah, sorry. you know? And so, yeah, you think about, like, how do I balance? What do I need right now? And I think, gosh, one thing I hear so often from people is, you know, nobody's ever said it to me like that before, or nobody's ever seen that piece of me before. And I just think those are the places where we've probably been listening to what's out in the media or even listening to our best friend who, you know, as much as they love us has a different life and then coming away feeling like we have work to do or we're broken or we're wrong. And we weren't and seen. And I think we don't see this day. beautiful little thing that we have, you know, cause we're running over it. Cause we're trying to like find the solution. Yeah. Rather than we just want to be seen and witnessed. Mm-hmm. And there's a, you know, and we just want to, we just want to know that we matter. And I think that, you know, to me, I have such a deep belief that each life does, I mean, well, number one, there's a mystery, right? I mean, we will never know all that there is to know because I think that then we don't get to play the life of the game of life, you know, like life wouldn't be what it is if we got to see behind the curtain. When you told me that, because you know, when I was going through my existential, like, why are we here? Like re- totally rewiring my philosophical spiritual beliefs. I remember in an email, you were like, well, we wouldn't, what's the point? Like, we're not supposed to know Then we wouldn't, we would know the end of the game. And I was like, oh, you're right. It's fun when we don't know <laughs> at times. Sometimes I'm like, I want to know. Oh, I know. All the God, answers. I, was, I always say to people, hey, look, I'm an astrologer. I totally want to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, obviously, I'm a control freak. Like, I absolutely <laughs> want to know, you know, so I get it. Like, you know, but I think also, you know, life, it is, it is, we can never know exactly. Like, I will never be right 100% of the time. You know, that's just not the nature of it. And but that's but, being human. I mean, that's what we talked about. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. Like, and I think what we can know is amazing. You know, if we start to pay attention and we do start to see this like underlying structure, we can start to have, I think, a broader perspective. And that's where wisdom comes from, right? Like when we yeah, because wisdom is just patterns, right? Is seeing it's just patterns. patterns. Yeah, and it, and I think, but I also feel like wisdom is also again knowing Saturn is the wisdom keeper. Wisdom is also slow. There's a, there's a time piece to wisdom, which is that wisdom is not gained overnight. And it's also when we have, when we, when we notice somebody else is being wise, we often, there's often a slowness to what they're suggesting, or there's like a, they've taken time or, do you know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a pacing element to wisdom that I, that I have noticed. That's an excellent point. Well, because I think even though our world has sped up the process, like humans have sped world, the world up in a way, but at the same, but 
the, that like mother nature has your back, like good things take time. <laughs> like nothing that is worthwhile comes easy. Like I, I just don't think so. Not often, you know, at least in my so, chart. <laughs> not, not, you know, I do like, I do work with people who, who do have that experience who like they're moving really fast. You know, that's just how it goes. And, and I don't have a lot of those people come to me because obviously a lot of those people don't consult astrologers because they're not experiencing difficult times. Yeah. You know, which is kind of, you know, so I don't like it. it and that's in and of itself fascinating to me that the types of people that do consult astrologers and the types of people that consult me as an astrologer, I'm, you know, I'm clearly not like, I'm not like, I'm, I'm usually not the somebody's beginner self reflection person. Mm. You know, people usually come from, and maybe I might be their first astrologer, but they don't usually come to me at the very beginning. You know, I don't usually end up working with a lot of younger people because they're kind of in a bigger hurry than w- what I, I mean, I'm often, I always give people homework during their sessions and you know, here's what I want you to be paying attention to, or you should try this out or, you know, here's some ways, some perspectives that, you know, on this particular thing that you're facing. And it's always really pragmatic because, you know, I just, I, I believe in pragmatic pragmatism when we're in the depths of, you know, kind of unknown swamp type experiences little baby steps are good. And I think a lot of times people, when they're younger, they are still more idealistic and they do want kind of, they're still are looking for the, the, um, the easy fix or the golden love and light, the love and light version. The love and light. Yeah, exactly. And I'm always like, Hey, look, you know what? Life is full of difficulty and it's full of, you know, riddles and, and it's also full of amazing things that if you try and solve the riddle too quickly, you will miss. Mm. you know so that's kind of I'm a big component of like you know I mean that's why we all love sunsets because we love to just stop and see them and so I'm like why you know this horror this horrible thing that's happening to you there are some beautiful things that are in the midst of it and you will miss them if you just keep focusing on trying to get through the pain Mm. yeah you know so let's come up with some strategies for for like bearing the pain more gracefully so that we can learn what it is that we have to learn. It reminds me, we had uh, Dr. Robin. Oh my God, my brain right now is totally escaping me. She's a functional medicine doctor. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how at Parsley Health, they practice slow medicine. And she's like, and you want us to practice slow medicine because we're going to really get to the root and not re-injure you in the process. Mm -hmm. And I think slow, you know, I'm a big believer. Truth is paradox. That's and t- they always say to go to go fast, we must go slow. So yeah, I think that's yeah, I important. Yeah, for your noticing, for your temperament to notice. Molly, this has been so wonderful. Any parting words on how? Oh, we're going to include a link where people can get their chart. Is there any planet that they should pay attention to for their health specifically? You know, I think physical you, and emotional. Yeah. Yeah. So I think just. Yeah. It's, you know, they're, they're, every chart is different, but it, when I go to look at health, the first two things that I always look at, and they're not always where I end up, so this will not work for everybody, but is the planet that rules the ascendant, so the first house, because that the first house is our body, it's us, it's how we begin things, but it's also the ship we sail in, which is our body and our personality. So that can tell us, you know, that can tell us a little bit about our health in general. Also, the planet that rules the sixth house, um, the moderns like to call the sixth house the house of wellness. Well, the traditionals called it the house of illness, because when you have wellness, you're not looking at your chart, right? (laughs) It's when you have illness that you're looking at your chart. So the sixth house can often tell, they also call it the house of um, slings and arrows. The sixth house can, among other things can be the place where just, you know, the, the slings and arrows that hit us that we did not have anything to do with. There's just the shit that happens to us comes often from the sixth house. So um, the planet that rules that house can sometimes show, like when I'm going to see a big hospitalization, sometimes there'll be something going on with the sixth house ruler. So those two planets would be you know, what I would look at. Um, are, are those two planets and signs where they're strong? Like what's the, what planet is it like if it's mars it's fire if it's jupiter it's air so that can give a little bit of information there and then what sign is it in how does it do in that sign that's starting to get a little bit more complicated than just the basic (laughs) you know the basic look i I would say if you're not even going to ever go look at your chart just start to pay attention to those four elements i mean i always think you can't go wrong if you pay attention to water, earth, fire, air, listen to your speech, listen to your friends talk, those elements will show up in the way people communicate. 
the way they, they describe events and the way they, do, they describe how they're feeling, oftentimes there will be words in those descriptions that are elemental. And then just pay attention to where you're at in your life, how you are in general, and the context, where you're living, the season that you're in. And those will often give you enough clues to start some first steps. I love that. And can you give the website where people can get their chart for free? It's astro.com. Um, A-S-T-R-O.com is, I, you know, I believe on there somewhere, there is a link to looking at charts and there's a way that you can get into, I haven't been on there in ages. So I go will, there and you can get yeah. your chart. And if you really want to use this and, and especially if you're having, you know, on in a transition, I was in a transition or you're having a difficult time, check out Molly's work it can be really, really helpful. It really helped me a couple of years ago when I was in a transition coming out of a tough couple of years myself, just really set me on a surrendered yet pointed and agency <laughs> full path uh, forward. So yeah. But in the meantime, think about your, your temperaments, especially as we're in a really hot, fiery, extreme season. If you're on the, in the Northern hemisphere, if you're in the Southern hemisphere, you might be going through the extreme colds as, as the climate changes. We are in a climate crisis. So that will, even a couple of degrees changes the earth and the earth is like massive. So imagine what a co- like hotter summers or colder winters does to your body. Which is Yeah, it's, it's going to definitely be about adding water. And, and I think for another one that people really have a hard time with, which will happen next is some is summer into autumn. And um, for some people that brings relief and for some people it's hard and both summer and autumn are both dry seasons. The fire and earth are both dry elements. And so again, both of those can have to do with making sure that you're staying hydrated and that you're staying and bringing some moisture into your system. You can totally Google foods that will bring moisture, coconut, cucumbers, things like that. Oh, I love that. It also made me realize why I love fall so much because I am a melancholy person. Like I love listening to melancholy music. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. it makes so much sense. <laughs> yep, 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 totally. So Molly, where can people find you and your brilliant, really thoughtful, thought-provoking, insightful work? <laughs> well, I have just started um, blogging again. So um, depending on when this interview actually airs, there'll be a few new ones up there on the website. I'm at mollymorrissey.com. And my name has got all sorts of double consonants in it. So when in doubt, add another consonant. Two R's, two S's, E-Y. <laughs> That's M-O-L-L-Y-M-O-R-R-I-S-S-E-Y.com. And again, we'll have Molly's link as well as her PDF that she's gifted to the insatiable listeners at AliShapiro.com backslash podcast, where you can get all the show notes, transcripts of each episode. And we'll also include the astro.com link. So you could get yeah, and I just am on their website, theastro.com. If you go into the extended chart selection area is, when, is where you'll be able to go through and as a guest user, get your chart done. And awesome. it'll just give you the chart. It's not going to give you any interpretations, but it'll at least give you the, the diagram. Love it. Get your chart, know your power, take your power back from the church <laughs> or from exactly. any authority that wants to, wants to control you. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. My pleasure. What a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. Have questions or reactions about the episode? Reach out to me on Instagram and Twitter at Ali M. Shapiro or Facebook at Facebook backslash Ali Marie Shapiro. And if you love the show, please leave an iTunes review and tell one friend this week about how to get the Insatiable podcast on their phone. See you on social media.